Charles, good to see you in Beijing. Nice to be back here. You have been doing research and try to explain to your Chinese counterpart about the differences between China, US and China, EU and European relations. Tell me more about some of the most important differences. I think it's very important to understand that China, sorry, that the United States and Europe have different interests vis-a-vis -vis China because the United States cares about what China is. The, EU, the EU cares more about what China does, by which I mean the EU worries about China being a rival power in East Asia. Chinese power per se is a worry to the US, whatever China does, but the Europeans care more about what they would say is Chinese behavior. What do you think the other way around? Does China care about what Europe is and what Europe does? I think, yes. If I could use Europe as such a general term. Yes, I, I, I think that China cares about what Europe does. At the moment, Europe is getting tough with China on economic issues and trade issues. The European Commission in Brussels is attacking China on its ex, some of its exports to the EU, claiming that China uses unfair subsidies, which may or may not be true, but that's the European claim. I think China cares about what Europe does more than what China is. What China thinks what Europe is is quite nice. It's a nice, it's, it's, it's good because it's not the same as the United States. It's part of a multipolar world, and China would be very happy if Europe developed as a stronger geopolitical entity, different from the United States, as to help to create a multipolar world order of the sort that China would like to see. Is that what's going on in Europe or not necessarily so? How do you read the signs among uh, different uh, capitals, especially some of the biggest capitals in Europe? Well, vis-a-vis -vis China, there are different views, of course, in Europe. Uh, for example, the Commission, as I said, is getting quite tough on China. It's trying to control exports of high technologies to China, as the Americans are doing also. But countries like Germany are resistant to that. Countries like Germany value their close economic relationship with China and are more reluctant to get tough with China. And I think there's a, there's a spectrum of views across the European Union. Most of them are sort of in the middle, saying when China behaves in ways that we don't like, we should call it out and criticize it, but we must have a very close economic partnership with China and we must work closely with China in combating problems like climate change and global pandemics. You can't, you can't ignore China, you have to work with China on many issues, that's what people think. And is it mainly a fact based on thinking or is it a fact based on realities? If you look at the China-Europe trade, which is more than 5% of the uh, European uh, GDP, but the US, of course, is uh, only less than 3% of China and US trade. So. Uh, is it based on necessity, the attitude of Europe toward China, uh, rather than uh, based on uh, ideas uh, portrayed by others to Europe? Well, I think Europe is getting, has got a bit tougher vis-a-vis -vis China in the last few years uh, for several reasons. One is that the Americans want it to get tougher because America's got tougher, and so that's why there is pressure on the Europeans to control exports of technology to China. But a lot of it is actually not because of American pressure, just because of the European perceptions of China doing things that, China, that Europe doesn't like on human rights, on the behavior of some of its companies, on its support for Russia, its indirect support for Russia and Ukraine. So I think it's both Chinese behavior and American pressure have led to Europe getting tougher, plus the overall intellectual climate against globalization that is, which is, we see this in America, China and Europe, there's more worry about being dependent on other, other countries for supplying key commodities or key technologies. And so there's more concern to have shorter supply chains and doing more things at home. So China has its dual circulation strategy. Europe has a number of pieces of legislation designed to make, give it strategic autonomy. America has the Inflation Reduction Act and so on. Right. The Chinese leaders usually suggest in their important uh, uh, speeches about China prefers to look at the long term. Uh, that is the common belief here among politicians here in China. Uh, now, they also ask others whether you are looking at the longer term. Well, I think the Chinese do take a very long term perspective compared to some Western countries, because Western countries have to worry about elections and politicians worry about how do they win next year's election or the, the, the election the year after next. So I think they're not very good at being long term. But there are certain trends clear and one clear trend is that China is a is a, a, an increasingly important power it's a dominant power in many parts of Asia and uh, the, the America and 
China are the two great superpowers in the world today. Europe is an economic superpower, but not a political superpower. And the question for Europe is, can it evolve in that direction to become geopolitically a stronger player? Mrs. von der Leyen, the president of the European Commission, would like Europe to become a, more of a geopolitical actor and more of a She superpower. also has her own political election cycles as well. Yeah, of course. She, she hopes to be reappointed to a second term and probably will be in a few months' time. But I think um, because Europe is still divided on, on foreign policy questions, it's hard to be a geopolitical actor. On, you, on Russia and Ukraine, it's quite uni fairly united. On China, it's sort of united, but not totally. On, on the Middle East, it's been a disaster. The Europeans have totally different views on Israel and Palestine and Gaza, which shows they've got a lot of progress to make in trying to develop a more unified approach to geopolitics and foreign policy. Now, China's attitude toward the European capitals are also very different in ways. Uh, for example, China-Germany, which has tremendous economic and trade interlinks. Uh, China-France, uh, uh, it's a different story, uh, even though we are going to see uh, important uh, high-level exchanges for the rest of the year. China-the UK, uh, now it's an interesting and evolving story. China and some of the Central and European countries, uh, uh, particularly Serbia, Hungary, uh, these economies uh, are very different from the rest of relations between China and some major European capitals. So how do you see these uh, traditionally handed down approach uh, plus the pragmatism that China has in its relations with uh, different European capitals? Well, I think China is trying to build close relations with all the European capitals. It rightly understands that a lot of the power in the EU resides with the national capitals rather than the Commission. But it shouldn't make the mistake of thinking it can ignore the Commission. That's the mistake the Americans and the British have sometimes made. You think you can go to the national governments, go to the French and the Germans to sort out a problem. On trade policy and economic policy, Mrs. von der Leyen and her Commission are very powerful indeed. So China shouldn't ignore its advice. So take the EU, the Commission, more seriously. And what else? That's your suggestion. Well, keep, 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 keep up. My, my suggestion would be um, if, if to get a better, a better relationship between the EU and China, that China should do more to open its markets. There is a huge trade deficit between the EU and China. It was about 400 billion euros worth of trade a year in deficit. And so the Europeans not unreasonably say, please open your markets more than you're opening them. The Chinese say they're opening the markets, but they're not actually doing a lot. And it's because China has not done more to open its markets, that's why the Commission has hit China with these recent measures against certain Chinese exports and it's claiming there are unfair subsidies behind these exports, backing up these exports. Some of the Commission, what well, the Commission says may not be true, it may be unfair, but so long as there's this huge deficit imbalance in trade between Europe and China, the Europeans are going to get more aggressive in terms of economic diplomacy and tariffs and so on. So the Americans will too. So my advice to Chinese friends is do more to open your markets if you can. Some of the earlier international norms and the rule of doing things certainly have been not necessarily adhered to, especially over the past few years. Now, how do you see that trend? How do you see China and Europe uh, both uh, claim that they adhere to the multilateralism, and they're a core supporter of that, uh, are dealing with it, and also likely to be able to defend it? I think there's some truth in that, in what you're saying. I think that China and the EU are committed to multilateralism. Uh, they both support the World Trade Organization, which the United States doesn't really do. They both support the United Nations. But then Europeans would say, well, part of the United Nations Charter is territorial integrity. So when Russia invades Ukraine and conquers some of Ukraine's territory, we, we would like China to take a stronger reaction than it has to that, because it, we see it as, as very much in breach of the UN Charter, which China, in theory, supports. In recent years, you wrote a book about the former EU Commissioner Jack Delors, and you argued about his uniqueness as a politician, quote unquote, to bring Europe together, to build the common European market. How much do you think inspirations from his generation that's been making concepts come true into reality and really creative be able to inspire us today and Europe today? Delors was a great man. The, the EU would not have got a single market or a, or a common currency without Delors' initiatives. He had the initiatives for both those phenomena. Uh, he, he did have great ideas for getting a more unified Europe, but to be fair to his successes who haven't achieved so much, he had a very favourable uh, 
conjuncture of circumstances when he was president from 1985 to 1995. There was economic growth. There were leaders like Kohl in Germany, Mitterrand in France, Thatcher in the UK, who were strong and effective, powerful leaders, Gonzalez in Spain. He had good, good material to play with. But he, and the fall of the Berlin Wall, of and the, course. The, the Berlin Wall created momentum for European unity, and that helped his plans for the euro. For, 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 for German unity, rather, that, that helped his plans for, for European unity. While his successors have had a more difficult world to live in, with more economic problems, more turbulence, perhaps there have been less, less able leaders in the main European capitals. But I think von der Leyen has emerged as the most powerful president since Jacques Delors. And she, hasn't, she has pushed the EU to be more united in certain respects, like the way it deals with health crises, the way it deals with sanctions, like the sanctions against Russia the way it deals with other issues too. She's, she's pushing greater unity, but she hasn't achieved as much as Delors achieved. But what about his inspiration for Europe as a whole? I'm not saying just von der Leyen herself, uh, you know, not limited to one commissioner, but rather to Europe well, th today. Well, there there's less idealism in Europe today. People are rather cynical and fed up with perhaps the, those people who wave the flag for European unification. It, there is still movement towards a more, more unified Europe. I think it's happening. But without a lot of popular support, there's, there's popular hostility to it. There's the so-called Eurosceptic parties on the far right, the AFD in Germany, the Rassemblement National in France, the, the Wilders party in the Netherlands, they are against mm -hmm. European integration. They, they, they don't win a majority of the votes, but they, they're quite powerful. They will get 20 or 30 percent of the votes in the European elections coming up in a few weeks' time, yeah. and they will put a break on European integration. Because European integration, although it's happening, maybe there's not a lot of popular enthusiasm for it. Mm. You argued that, that his generation, especially himself, by creating the European single market and also the European currency, tried to bring up new ideas. You also argued that during his time there were, especially himself, uh, ambiguous uh, political identities. You also argue he is uh, a political uh, tactician, uh, and the list goes on. It seems that there is a very flexible personality uh, that has been coming out of your book when you're trying to describe him and his generations of leaders. And I really wonder how much inspiration that could give us today, you know, whether it is the European leaders or political leaders elsewhere in the world. Well, I think Delors was somebody who always saw the benefits of cooperation and creating strong multilateral structures. He did it within the European Union, but you can also extend that to the global level as well. He would have been, he was in favor of the World Trade Organization and the strong United Nations. I think he understood that in a very difficult, complicated world, different countries need to work together through multilateral structures to create common benefits for all of them. And he understood that very well and achieved a lot in Europe and others can be inspired by him to achieve more at the global level, I think. I really wonder what he would say when looking at the realities today. Yeah. But thank you so much, Charles, for providing your insights. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Okay.